still fighting up in the hills. And her assignment was to uh, help such as she could to escape down through the Balkans and to save their lives. She was a young poet also. She left us several poems. Well, the Germans found her, caught her, and they tortured her, and she died. She was 23, 23 years old. And before she died, she wrote this. To die, to die in youth, no, no, I did not want it. I loved the warmth of sun, the lovely light. I loved song, shining eyes, and not destruction. I did not want the dark of war, the night. No, no, I did not want it. Well, Hannah Senish is forever young. Some of us here have enough years, so we have to ask, why was I spared when so many were slaughtered? And you, who are approaching uh, 23, and God willing will live well beyond it, must answer with your life the question which the Holocaust, that massive water of the 20th century puts to every one of us. What am I going to do with life? Am I going to sit it out on the balcony? Or am I going to participate as an educated, wise as well as skilled, committed human person to the service of the common good? That's the real story of the Holocaust and the real meaning of it. Either you get it or you don't. Spectator is spectator made no difference, of course. But the question is, what would have happened if one of those spectators uh, had become uh, a fighter in the arena against Nazism. And I, I'll, I'll tell you, uh, give you one illustration. Uh, in 1939, on June 17, I visited with uh, Bishop Otto Melli, who was the uh, bishop of my denomination in Germany, the Bischof of the Methodist in Kirche. Now, this Methodist bishop, my father in God is a loyal Methodist, told of how Hitler had come into the midst of a broken Germany, distraught Germany, finding the young people dancing and staying out late nights and smoking and raising the devil generally. And he had brought them into uh, youth training camps and given them an athletic kind of spirit and drilled them in discipline and prepared them to make sacrifice for the people. Thus, oh, we have to get that note of pathos. Thus, oh. And um, then he concluded with this statement that the church should stay out of politics shouldn't concern itself with all of the arguments going on. And then he made the most political statement possible, Hitler is God's man for Germany. Now that was eight months after Kristallnacht, when 20,000 Jewish men were shipped off to concentration camp, 700 businesses were broken into and their windows shattered and pillaged. Over 200 synagogues destroyed, burnt. Well, 
that was supposed to be a leader of the Christian church. He didn't do it himself. He never killed anybody. He just sat there on the balcony. And if he had joined those who resisted, like Father Delps, like Probst Lichtenberg, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, like Klaus von Stauffenberg, like Helmut von Moltke, and I am naming people who were butchered finally because they had the Christian courage to stand against the adversary, that would have meant a whole sector of the German people that would not have been misled and betrayed by a spectator. I think we could multiply illustrations. Can you think the awareness of the Holocaust, the constant reminder of the Holocaust will prevent it from happening again? This kind of process? Now, uh, that's a very good question, but I think it's the kind that we need to discuss in the groups uh, first, perhaps. I'll just answer, give my answer quickly, and then we'll get some more wisdom out of the group. I believe that we have to tell the truth, and we have to tell the story when things are really important on a win, lose, or draw basis. That is, I don't think we can say, well, we do this because we hope to prevent future Holocaust. Of course we do. That's not the real reason. I believe, like uh, Jeremiah, that if I thought the Lord would wrap it up tomorrow morning, I'd still go out and plant a tree. And uh, truth is the truth is the truth. As Gertrude Stein said, a rose is a rose is a rose. So I don't tell it because uh, I am speculating about what's going to happen. You know. I have to tell it even sometimes I wonder whether it's getting through at all. Christian or religious at all? And uh, the uh, answer I would give is that it's not mine to judge. That is, I have a right as a professing Christian to point out when we Christians have failed to show courage. I don't have a right to even imply that a humanist, or for that matter a skeptic, for that matter a Hindu, and certainly a Jew, can't have courage because he's not a Christian. That would be absurd. We have all the world of evidence to the contrary. But I do have a right to face the particular crisis and challenge that if we are, as Christians, claiming that we have a faith and a style of life which does credit to our profession, then we have to show it. Does it do good to uh, plow over the ground again and again on the Holocaust, or should we forget it and bury it? Uh, that's also a very important substantive issue, which I think needs to get into the groups uh, before I do too much with it. Uh, but be sure and bring it up, uh, because it's, uh, it's, uh, it's a critical importance. Uh, I think it's significant that a generation had to pass before anybody could deal with it in Germany or in Israel or in America. And I believe that we still live in the memory of the exodus out of slavery toward the promised land, and we still live in the shadow of Mount Sinai. I don't believe that a thing of the measure of the Holocaust can be forgotten and buried. 
If you do that in an individual trauma, in due time, as the psychiatrist will guarantee to you, you will blow up. If a society tries to bury a trauma of this dimension, it will erupt and destroy it. We have to wrestle with the meaning of it. I think we're getting substantive. Do you have any clarification? Yeah. Yes, I'd just like to know um, how long it takes for the church to realize what it has. Now wait, uh, you mean literally or uh, realize in the sense that something is beginning to be done about it? No, I'm talking about at the time, the Holocaust. If they were, especially like the bishops of the top, how long would it take to realize what had happened? Had happened? Well, uh, this is one of the most important historical facts, and it is a clarification uh, question. Uh, in 1942, Kurt Gerstein, who was an SS colonel and had been in the Protestant church in Dahlem, Berlin Dahlem, as a youth, came to Berlin and told the papal nuncio what was going on in the death camps in East Europe, got the message to Alan Dulles and our intelligence headquarters, OSS, in Bern, got the message to Gerhard Riegner, who was the World Jewish uh, World uh, yeah, Congress uh, representative in Rome, and through them, it came to the United States. So that by the end of, uh, by early 1943, or perhaps December of 42, Roosevelt knew about it, Churchill knew about it, and the leaders of the country knew what was going on. Stephen Wise, the great rabbi, also got the word and tried desperately to convince not only Christian leaders, but also Jewish organizational leaders in this country. And uh, you say, when did they know? Well, in the most literal sense, uh, uh, that's, I gave you the schedule. But it's one thing to know facts, and it's another thing to appropriate and internalize what you know and prepare to act on it. Most people thought, after they would thought it over for a while, that's some more war propaganda. And uh, Christian Century, which is a leading Protestant journal, referred to it as Jewish propaganda. So you say, when did they know? Well, we only know at the point when we appropriate and build into our flick, as it's called, and our action, that which we know. If there are people in the back, there are plenty of seats to introduce them to you. Most of you know the person from the, the panel that we have, uh, but the entire panel. Um, first of all, the, the, we're very pleased that uh, another member of our human relations committee, the president of the 11th grade here at the school for Juan Jackson, uh, will be on our panel. Um, Everyone here, I believe, knows Jerry Downs, who is the chairman of the English department, uh, is an author, a radio personality, the most important, uh, one of the most beloved uh, members of the Roman family, and has been for many, many years. Uh, the third member of our panel is Mr. Ron Shaparo. Uh, he is uh, the president of the Baltimore uh, Jewish Council, uh, and he also a parent uh, of a child in the middle school. Uh, Dr. Littell, of course, everyone is well aware of, uh, our final member uh, of this panel, and, and this is our, our, our answering panel, is Dr. Littell uh, and Mr. Alan Udall. Mr. Udall was born in Brooklyn. Uh, he has, uh, he is practically uh, studying at Catholic University, received his doctorate in the host of Holy Holocaust theology. At the same time, and how he does it, I don't know, he is the director uh, and associate professor at the Baltimore Hebrew College. He joined us uh, last Wednesday and had a session with our parent leaders. Uh, he is doing this because he wants to do it, uh, and we're extremely grateful that they have you with us uh, here today. Before we do start, 
questioning. I, I would like to just give Dr. Rudolph uh, one moment to, uh, uh, to speak to us. Thank you. <coughs> Thank you, Mr. Obert. I want to uh, just take a moment or two to um, uh, thank uh, everyone participating in this program and for making it possible for me to participate. And I wanted to uh, just uh, spontaneously uh, say some words of appreciation uh, for Dr. Patel, who's here this morning. There is a, uh, a, a way in which the kind of person that Dr. Patel is, there's a way in which this kind of person is described in classical Jewish literature. The uh, description is the Hasidei Umal Ka'olam, the righteous people of the world. Not the righteous Jews of the world, but the righteous people of the world. The rabbis were especially concerned that not only the Jews, but all the righteous people would find, would find grace and salvation in God's eyes. And um, I want to say that uh, Dr. Littell, who has on this the most important of issues, who has really befriended the Jewish people and uh, publicly expressed his conscience as a Christian, uh, is someone who is very dear to, uh, to Judaism and to the Jewish people. And I just wanted to, to know, uh, I wanted to say that publicly. Uh, in his presence. I hope I didn't embarrass you by saying that. Thank you, Mr. Dahl. Once again, there are some people in the back, and there are seats here if you'd like to come in uh, and, and hear. Uh, the questions that you have discussed in your seminars, uh, we have up here, and our committee is looking at them. They will try to put them in some sentence of order, and we'll pose some of these questions. Um, after each one, if someone in the audience would like to expand upon or request an expansion upon that answer, I will ask the audience to do so after each question, so that you'll have an opportunity to, to uh, pursue a particular question that maybe you were responsible for raising. As the moderator, uh, let me take one prerogative. And that is to ask the first question. Um, no, maybe it's uh, a very difficult one to pose. When you have a program such as this, you take risks. Uh, you take risks because there are differences among human beings which uh, we all recognize and which uh, play their way out in many uh, unfortunate ways. One of the risks is, and this has been expressed, this program is really nothing else than the Jews trying to force their opinions and their sympathy upon us. And it may be really in effect if they did the right thing. It's the most profound question. And I'd like to ask Dr. Michelle to respond. Well, uh, the, uh, the question is, why is the Holocaust uh, important to non-Jews, since it's obviously an event in Jewish history? And uh, the thing that's clear to me is that um, the Holocaust has become a confrontation of conscience which is far more serious for Christendom than it is for the Jewish people. Uh, the Lord has delivered Israel. I am not sure that Christianity is out of the uh, trauma and the shame of realizing that when the chips were down and the civilized world was faced with uh, a system of thought and the leadership uh, of the monstrous character of uh, Hitler and Nazism, most of the Gentiles fled for cover, including the Christians, leaving the Jews standing alone to take the hammer blows of the adversary. Now, how do you deal with moral cowardice when you have to look back on it? This is an acute problem for Christians and for Western civilization. The old rabbis used to teach that if the Gentiles had understood 
the meaning of the destruction of the temple, they would mourn it more than the Jews. The temple was uh, the center of uh, monotheism, of obedience to the one God who is God in the midst of an idolatrous world. And my message is that if the Christians were to understand the meaning of the Holocaust, they would mourn it more than the Jews. It's the unresolved issue in Christian worship, theology, and history, and credibility. Why do we hear so much? It was almost frustration on the part of several of the boys. Why do we have to hear about the persecution of the Jews? What about the gypsies and the other people who were persecuted in the camps? Um, why don't we hear more about them? Well, firstly, I think it's very important to uh, point out that Tyranny, in almost any form, is an assault on human dignity. For tyranny to take on the kind of global structure that it took on during the reign of the Nazis, such an assault could not be directed frontally. Before the death machine of Nazi Germany to extend across the face of Europe. It was necessary for the underpinnings of civilization to be removed. Language had to be corrupted. You got to find a way of speaking about mass murder as special handling. Not only was the language corrupted, but the arts, speech itself, had taken on such a character that Bertolt Brecht, the great German poet, was able to say in one of his poems, what times are these when a conversation about trees is almost a crime because it leaves so much unsaid? What had happened was humanity itself was being undermined. And the reason why I think one of the reasons why I think the Jewish issue is the central issue is that this massive assault on human dignity could not have been made in the name of a genocidal war against gypsies or a genocidal war against Slavs. That kind of propaganda, that kind of program would not have enlisted the aid of tens of thousands of people necessary to turn a death process into a, a bureaucracy. The Jewish question is the central question in the Holocaust because without the Jewish question, I firmly believe that a genocidal war against any of the other groups could not have been achieved by the Nazis. When my colleague spoke, I was reminded, reminded of uh, one of the two great encyclicals of good Pope John XXIII, an encyclical which emphasized the importance of a commitment to the dignity, the liberty, and the integrity of the human person. And that's what we're essentially dealing with, and that's why the Human Relations Committee's initiative in this case assumes uh, broader significance than uh, concentrating on the Holocaust alone. But the Holocaust is a kind of a plumb line by which you can test all kinds of uh, wickedness and mass murder directed at other peoples. It has a unique character, and it also has a uh, significance in terms of other events. 
it's a, it's a kind of a sign over the 20th century. Uh, two years ago, the Armenians uh, uh, memorialized or had their 60th uh, anniversary memorial for the, the time when 60% of their people, literally 60% of their people, the oldest Christianized nation in the face of the earth, had been slaughtered at the hands of the Ottoman Empire in its last days, its collapse. And Archbishop Manukian, who was the head of the Armenian Church of America, said at that time, he didn't say, why do you worry about the Jews? Look at what happened to us, which would be a bad faith and inauthentic. He said, when our people were being slaughtered, the world didn't care. And look how it built up until six million Jews were slaughtered. That is an authentic stance on the part of others who have suffered greatly in the 20th century. So that this is the way in which we deal with the Holocaust as a discrete event, which, however, teaches us the way we can think about genocide and about other assaults on, uh, on peoples. Now, the final question is why bring it up now. Uh, the question is why we didn't deal with it earlier. And the answer is that one generation at least had to pass before anybody could deal with it, except a few poets, a few solitaries. Now we're beginning to deal with it as Jews and Christians and thinking people generally because we have enough distance so that we won't get burned. And it's the kind of an event which uh, which can burn you if you don't approach it with sensitivity as well as intelligence. <laughs> Thank you very much. That is the number one question, perhaps. And I'm not sure that it's going to be answered tomorrow, let alone today. I have the feeling that uh, the first generation that came out of Egypt at the time of the Exodus really didn't get the point of uh, the Exodus. They complained all the time, most of them. And they didn't really understand what had happened in the giving of the law by which nations and generations are made or broken in Sinai. Probably all I could think of is my feet hurt, you know? And I think that the first generation after the Holocaust is sort of inclined to uh, think at that level. But as we begin to uh, work through it together, we begin to see some things which we can do. For example, in 1973, for the first time, a handful of Christian congregations in this country began to observe Yom HaShoah is the Memorial Day, to have the prayers, the hymns, the litany, appropriate to purge one's heart of shame and to bring about a recommitment to life. Last year, we had several hundred congregations, Christian congregations now, I'm not talking about the observance on the Jewish side, in which 
this process was working. Now that takes time. It takes time until you have the poetry, the memorization, the hymns, the litanies, the, uh, at that level, which uh, make a difference. We've had scholars' conferences and seminars and books going for a number of years, but we would do that sort of thing or not the issue. The issue is how do we appropriate this uh, alpine event, to use the poet Bialik's uh, word, uh, a formative event, a massive event, in such a way that it heals rather than burns. And the only way you can answer that is to keep coming back. Somebody knows uh, a liturgy to be used in a Christian congregation. Somebody knows a, a movie which can be shown in the classroom. Somebody else that works on it so that we have a, uh, eventually a consensus build up as to how we view and how we deal with and how we respond to uh, the message of the Holocaust. I'd like to ask, uh, why didn't the U.S. intervene uh, to a greater extent to help them stop the extermination of Jews? Now that's a very important question, and it's much debated now on such uh, an issue as, for example, why didn't we bomb the approaches to the death camps? Since we bombed within five miles of Auschwitz, why couldn't we have bombed the railroad tracks? And we now have the surveys, aerial surveys, which means that they could identify the camp and the location and everything by the Auschwitz where three million were done in. And the answer is because the people who made the decisions didn't think it was that important. 